Okay, so welcome everybody to the September edition of the Myco Talks. We'll be introducing our speakers in more detail later, but today we're going to hear from Peter Cook in Exeter and from Kirsten Nielsen at the University of Minnesota. And I'd like to welcome you all on my own behalf, on behalf of the co-chair Sarah Gaffin from the University of Pittsburgh and also the rest of the organizing committee. So just to remind you that the Myco Talks the philosophy and origin is to uh, to feature talks from the diversity of mycology, diversity of individuals, career stage, gender, geography and field. And what we will have is two 30 minute talks today, uh, followed by 30 minutes of in-depth discussion. And can I please remind you to submit your questions using the Q&A function of Zoom, and please not through chat. If you use chat, we might miss them. You won't be able to see others, other people's questions, but the moderators will. These talks are being recorded and the recordings will be available on the dedicated YouTube channel later. Can I also remind you that you need to register for each session separately, individually? So coming up next month, we have Betty Wu Shea from National Taiwan University and Salome Lieben Gut Landman from the University of Zurich, followed in November by David Denning and uh, Anita Sill. And also for the trainees, there's a separate uh, session. So for those of you who are interested, these talks take place on the second Thursday of the month, though they do vary depending on where the speaker is. So please get in touch at the website um, as shown there if you're interested in participating. Okay, so now I would very much like to welcome um, our first speaker, Dr. Peter Cook. So Peter is a Wellcome Trust Sir Henry Dale Fellow at the MRC Centre at Exeter. So he's had the joy of setting up his uh, group during a pandemic. He works on Aspergillus fumigatus, particularly how it trig triggers the immune response to mediate chronic airway uh, allergic diseases like asthma. So Peter did his PhD at the University of York, then to the University of Edinburgh and the University of Manchester. Um, and he has described several discoveries about the induction and regulation of type 2 inflammation. So he moved to Exeter in 2020, where his group are now investigating how innate immune cells in the lung orchestrate inflammation against fungal spores. So we're very much looking forward to hearing him and over to you, Peter. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Let me just, um, and then going to, so I'll, I'll carry on and I'm sure people will tell me if they can't see anything properly. <laughs> so, so it's a huge um, thank you uh, for the very kind introduction and huge thanks to the organisers uh, for the Micah Talks for um, letting me speak to you all today. It's, a, it's an amazing series. I really enjoyed it. It's a beautiful work that people have shown. And now I realise how daunting it is to actually present on one as well. So. But hopefully, yeah, I can present something that will be of interest to people. So, okay, so my group then is really interested in understanding what's going on at the lung barrier and how we're continually dealing with fungi on a daily basis. But if you take a step back from that and think about what the lung has to do, it's kind of remarkable. So we have to breathe in 12,000 litres of air every day. And it means that all of us are breathing in sort of one to two billion particles. I think these are staggering numbers and it's kind of incredible that any of us are able to breathe in this and, and survive. But, um, but when it goes wrong, of course, people think of, of many triggers that can cause lung diseases and particular asthma, which I'm interested in. And um, a lot of focus is placed on things like pollution, household conditions, urban environments, pollen, house dust mite in particular, as immunologists, bacteria and viruses, but yet fungi, uh, if if um, that's it. there you go. So fungi though are are crucial yet I think very much underappreciated triggers of this kind of response, and so that and this is very much kind of what what my group is is working upon. Okay, so I don't think I really need to get across the importance of fungi in driving allergic inflammation to this audience, but but just kind of a very brief recap. We focus on Aspergillus primarily because it's sort of the most abundant fungal species that we breathe in. And it's quite clear that, um, you know, so we're breathing in thousands of these spores every day. So yeah, it's kind of remarkable. All of us at this very moment, anybody watching has aspergillus in their lungs at this very moment, which I think is a remarkable fact, really. And so 
But it's quite clear that aspergillus can worsen asthma. It can really, you know, people who have died from asthma, it's obviously a very multifactorial disease and causes of death can be many and varied, but half of the patients that sort of can die from asthma tend to be very heavily sensitized to fungi. So it's sort of a real indicator perhaps that you know, fungi is a real driver of severe asthma. And I would argue fungi can also mediate um, the initiation events of asthma in the, in the first place. And one of the unique features of aspergillus spores, I think you know, Elaine talked about very nicely in her talk a few micro talks ago, um, was how small these spores are, which means they go quite deep into our airways. And that means it avoids a lot of the mechanical upstream barriers that we have. And it means that our innate immune cells present in the barriers, uh, particularly macrophages and dendritic cells deep in the airways, have kind of a real challenge. So on a daily basis, they're having to clear fungal spores yeah, what, and I guess in a nutshell, this is really the killer question that my group's interested in is what, what causes them to suddenly, you know, they're continually clearing quite happily. Why do they suddenly start driving responses that are sort of deleterious and, you know, and causes disease such as allergic inf inflammation? And I guess it's that, what is that switch that we're, we're really fascinated by? And today I'm going to discuss two stories about this, both of which are unpublished, but hopefully you'll be able to read them very soon. And I'd be really keen to hear people's comments or thoughts, kind of the work that we're doing. So, so to kick off then, um, I, I should also, apologies for more introduction, but I, I realized that not everybody in the audience might not be thinking about allergic inflammation as much as I do. So I just wanted to have a brief overview very quickly. And so when we think of the allergens that we're breathing in and our innate immune cells, some of which I've already talked about, but then we have cells like innate lymphoid cells, gamma delta T cells, epithelial cells themselves, of course, there are, there are others though, of course. And yeah, asthma is thought to be a very much a type two disease. So uh, type two, uh, linked to affect cells like eosinophils, type 2 um, CD4 T cells, and eight lymphoid cells. And these all secrete these cytokines, 4, 5, 13, which are classified as type 2 cytokines. And these are crucial at pretty much orchestrating all downstream immune events to, you know, thought to drive asthma. So, you know, so all the cells that goblet cell hyperplasia, um, you know, matrix wound repair remodeling, airway hyper responsiveness, all linked to these cytokines. Oh, well, that was what's thought. And what was quite fascinating a few years ago is when the therapeutics targeting these type 2 cytokines, the sort of, you know, clinical trial data came in, they were only really partially successful. And I think, I think since then, what's really emerged is that asthma is a really heterogeneous disease, fascinatingly so. And so actually you get some patients very much who have those kinds of responses that I was just talking about. We'd also get patients on this end of the spectrum, which have a much more IL-17 based or type 17 based effective response with neutrophils perhaps, and particularly IL-17 secretion by CD4 T cells. And so, yeah, this is a fascinating paradigm that I think we're still struggling to understand what's going on. How can both responses be going on at the same time? Is one amplifying the other? And I think what you know, we're really fascinated by is you know, how does sensitization to aspergillus fit within this? And firstly, you know, obviously many groups are working on these kinds of questions, but what we're really intrigued by is that, is there a role for these sort of upstream innate cells in orchestrating these downstream events? And could that be actually a really neat way to not only understand this process much better, but actually lead to better therapeutic strategies, which obviously are sorely needed. And then finally, and you know, amazingly so, we still don't really understand how dendritic cells are driving type two immunity, despite many groups over many years working on this question. Can we actually start understanding how fungus in particular is orchestrating dendritic cells to drive this response? So um, the mouse model we're using um, is, is a model published by David Corey in some really beautiful work a few years ago. And, and they showed that if you give a low dose of spores, 400,000 spores, I mean, it obviously, it's still quite high, but it's much lower than that of the invasive models that people use with aspergillus. Um, and the majority, the key point though, is that the majority of spores are cleared within four hours and certainly gone after each dose. So whether you look after the first dose or the ninth dose, three doses a week, we really don't see a buildup of fungus over time. So this is what we do a lot of. We take the lavage of the lungs as a readout of influx into the airways, and we look at, we do lots of flow. Um, and so, you know, so effectively, these are macrophages, these are xenophils, some markers of type 2 immunity, and these are neutrophils, approximate markers of type 17 immunity. And if you look very early on after three doses, we really don't see very much going on. Yet when we look after six doses, we now start seeing a real shift. We see a decrease in the proportion of uh, macrophages and a real increase in the xenophilia and neutrophils. And in fact, you can keep dosing and you keep driving this response. And actually, we think it plateaus around after nine doses. You can keep giving more, but it doesn't get any worse, but it just sort of sustains it. So we thought this was really cool because actually this could be therefore a really neat model to tease apart those kind of questions that I was talking about in the slide before, given that we're seeing this sort of simultaneous type 2 17 response 
in you know, being mediated by the, the aspergillus. And so, to, but granular sites obviously alone is not necessarily strong enough data to prove that it is a type 217 response. So what we utilized was cytokine reporter mice. Um, so if you're not familiar with these, all you need to worry about is that 13 is type 2, and that will appear in this box here, and 17 is type 17, and that appears in this box here. And what you can see is very early on after those three doses, not much is going on. We see a subtle increase in R17, but it's really not that dramatic. But then when we look after six doses, and particularly after nine doses, you really start seeing this strong um, IL-13 type 2 population and this strong IL-17 response as well. So this sort of is showing that constant spore exposure is absolutely able to trigger both of these cytokine responses in, in this mouse model. So at this stage, though, people, and this is really what we want to do more over the coming years, and I did this when I was based in Manchester, is can we look at fungal human asthma and actually see these features that we're seeing in the mouse model? Is this indicative of what's going on in people? Uh, pretty important question. So what we were able to do um, with lots of help from lots of colleagues, so you know, very thankful to them, is that we were able to take um, sputum from a range of different patient groups. And the blue is severe asthmatic without fungal sensitization. And the SAS stands for severe allergic, uh, sorry, severe asthma with fungal sensitization, apologies. And ABPA is allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. So effectively, you know, for the purpose of this talk, we can kind of group these together, sort of fungal asthma. And I'm not going to show you the cell analysis that we've done, but I'm just going to show you the supernatant analysis analysis that we've done with, with Luminex on the cytokines. And very reassuringly, we found that the type 2 factors, when we looked at the sputum of all these severe asthma groups, had very strong type 2 responses and also quite high 17 responses. And you know, we were really intrigued by this because this is you know, a first indicator, really, that this mouse model we're looking at is kind of generating features of inflammation that we're seeing in these patient cohorts, which is quite exciting. We really want to drill more into sort of these kinds of samples in our work in the future. But going back to the sort of story then is like what we all wanted to see is are these cell types that we're seeing you know what are the cell types that are driving this sort of cytokine environment that we're seeing in these mice and so um we went back to that mouse model that i talked about two slides ago and what i was able to do was um sort of identify certain cell populations of interest so cd4 t cells in green gamma delta t cells in red and innate lymphoid cells which we were expecting to be the major cell type coming up this early wave of cytokine driving this response we're expected to come up really prominently as people have seen in other situations um, that are similar but what was quite remarkable is that when we actually looked over the time course if you just look at the type 2 response you can see hopefully it's mainly green there's really no red so there's no gamma delta t cell involvement no real innate lymphoid cell involvement and when we look at the um, IL-17 cytokine it was a real mix it was a mix of red and green and really not much blue so i can graph this up to convince you uh, even further hopefully and you can see that the 13 is really quite striking of the cd4 t cells really nothing coming from the other populations of the, the substantial and then you can see this mix going on in the 17 signature so this was surprising we were not expecting that so we so there's no major increase in ilcs and in fact data that i really don't have time to show you but i'd love to um, but hopefully you can read about it soon, is that we, we basically went through a depletion set of experiments with gamma delta T cells, the CD4 T cells, and we showed actually that all of this is mediated by the CD4 T cell. These other cell types don't seem to be involved. If you deplete the T cells, everything seems to fall away. So, so this is a completely T cell driven process. Now that's exciting for us, because obviously at the start, we were talking about you know, these innate cells orchestrating these sort of downstream events. T cells need stimulating. So that would imply us that maybe antigen presenting cells, particularly dendritic cells and macrophages, are actively promoting these responses. And that's kind of what we wanted to go on to next. So to prove this, we utilized another mouse model. And this is a mouse called c 11 c dog mice. And these express the human diphtheria toxin linked to expression of the model of the uh, marker C lemon C. This is an integrin involved expressed on macrophages and dendritic cells in the lung. So if you give diphtheria toxin into these mice, you selectively deplete any cell which is expressed in C lemon C. So effectively you remove these populations. And so we had, um, you know, so we gave the mice um, aspergillus for the first week, completely comp you know, wild type, the cells were there, but then we started depleting the DCs the second week. So we think, remember the onset of this response is around day 12. So we're sort of depleting those for there. You can only give the DTX for a short window. That's why we didn't do it for longer. Um, and so when we did this, um, it was quite striking. We found that the wild type response, um, interest of the cytokine staining of the T cells, and we, we've looked at all the other readouts and saw similar things, but again, lack of time, apologies. But what we saw, if you look at the T cells, is you can see a really nice type two response 
and R17 response. And this was completely reduced of uh, that when we in mice that express the transient. So those cells would be depleted. And you can see I've graphed this up for the other cytokines we looked at too. You can see that all the type two cytokines we looked at were significantly substantially down and the 17 was down. The other cytokines we looked at seemed very much you know, not affected. So this sort of is real nice evidence then that dendritic cells and macrophages are generally driving this allergic inflammatory response, seemingly both at the same time. Um, so, so this kind of got us really excited about what we could do next with this. So I've, I've been a little bit disingenuous up to this point because I've referred to these populations as single entities when that's not true. They're actually sort of different subsets of these cells. And we've looked at macrophages, but I'm not going to talk about them today. I'm going to talk mainly about the role of dendritic cells. And they have the presence of dendritic cell subsets. So people who are unfamiliar with that, I just hopefully have a couple of slides just to explain what, what these mean. So we, the reason why it's important, it's not just fun looking at subsets. So I think it is great fun. It's also really important to understand their function. And so what I mean by that is we now refer to dendritic cells, which are really adept at cross-presenting uh, on the MHC class one pathway that can drive CD8 T cell responses really potent at driving um, interferon gamma, very important for uh, bacteria and viral responses. We now refer to these as CDC1s, and we can now use markers, and we know the transcription factors that can kind of drive those cells. And what was quite striking is uh, we were able to get these mice. So these are depletable. You know, these mice are knockout for the CDC1, so they never have them at all. And then we expose those mice to aspergillus, and we didn't see a dramatic impact on that allergic inflammatory response. So that implies that you know, they're not essential. That's not to say they have no role at all. And in fact, we'll be keen to look at that further. But you know, from the surface, we think they're not, they're not absolutely critical for driving this response. So we wanted to look at the other subsets. And then this is where it gets a bit confusing. So, um, so we have other subsets referred to as CDC2 subsets because they drive A type 2 response and it's, you know, so it's the one after CDC1s. But then we also have DCs which are coming from monocytes that people have talked about before. And you know, it's very difficult to actually tease these apart. So when's it an inflammatory DC? When's it a CDC2? You know, and again, we think that you know, this sounds quite you know, um, semantic differences, who cares? But it, can, it matters because we think that actually this has really hampered our ability to define the mechanism, going back to the, one of my intro slides about why don't we understand how they're doing that. So what we did, as with others, is utilized um, single cell RNA sequencing to help with this. So we took naive mice, mice early exposed to aspergillus, or mice sort of had this full-blown allergic response to aspergillus, and took the dendritic cells from the lungs of those mice and did single cell RNA sequencing on them. And so um, what we found was more subsets than what we were, than what we I proposed the previous slide. And it's kind of easier to look at this at the Tisney plot. So apologies of the, of the many colors, it's slightly, slightly garish, but you do run out of colors when you're trying to an analyze these things. But effectively, if you, if you look at the yellow, um, the colors of the dots relate to where the samples have come from. And you can see the yellows are the CDC ones. We see a population that we've identified as CDC twos. We've seen a population which is CCR7, which was a surprise. So these are express high levels of the chemokine CCR7, which is involved in migration of dendritic cells. And then we saw these other clusters of populate of cells that we've kind of labeled as inflammatory DCs, which may or may not come from monocytes and even a population of monocytes themselves. And so, so others also have looked at this, not in aspergillus settings, but in other lung inflammatory settings and have seen similar sub cell, sub, um, cell populations, which is reassuring that our analysis is, is actually fitting with that of the, the sort of rapidly emerging literature in this field. And, and I guess we have then this question of, okay, this is all very nice, but which ones are driving that response? Can we actually, now we identify, can we work out which one is driving one response? Or is one driving both or is one driving one or versus the other, et cetera? And, but before we even do that, and actually this is quite tricky, is can we actually prove that these clusters are generally existing in the tissues? And to do this, um, we, we took an approach where we took the top hits of each cluster that we could identify and get an antibody or a labeled chemokine for and developed a panel using mass or flow cytometry. Um, at, we've started with the BD Fact Symphony. We've actually got up to about 40 markers now um, with the Aurora, which is a really beautiful machine. And you can actually now really define these sort of populations and using, if you gate on your DC populations, you have other markers where you can rule out other cell types, gate on your DC, then you do the same unbiased analysis that you do with your single cell, you can actually in an unbiased manner see if you're seeing the same clusters that we saw with the single cell. And I guess you probably guessed, I wouldn't be telling you this if it didn't work, but it's still amazing to me that it has worked. And what you can see is that you know, now we've got a flow panel 
we can sort of we've I tried to keep the colors similar to what I just showed you. So you've got the yellows in, in CDC ones, the oranges are the uh, CCR7, the shades of reds, the different CDC2 populations we found, and the shades of blue and sort of lilac and green are the sort of inflammatory DCs monocytes. And what we can see now we've got a flow panel, we can actually we can actually look at many different samples at once. And actually what we're able to quantify how these proportions are changing throughout this time course of this allergic response. And what we saw is, is the red ones are the major ones that seem to be coming up really quite nicely. And also those inflammatory DCs. So, which was, you know, surprising actually, you know, so the other population, we already knew the yellow ones were not that important. So the fact they're decreasing is, is not surprising, but yeah, so we, we thought we're surprised to see such an increase of the inflammatory cells. So, but of course, this is still just sort of correl you know, we're still tracking stuff. You know, can we actually work out what's generally mediating these responses? And one nice way to think about that with a dendritic cell is to utilize, um, you know, to look at the lymph node. So if it's a dendritic cell, it's in the tissue site, it's binding antigen, and it's migrating to the draining lymph node and driving the immune response. So if by looking at the lymph node, could we actually work out which one of these clusters is actually most, like, most likely going to be important? And, and so this is the lung data that I've just shown you. And when we took lymph nodes from exactly the same mice, exactly the same experiment, we did the same panel, we got a completely different picture of what's getting to the lymph node, which was really astounding. And so what we saw is that we still saw, we still saw CDC1s, but again, by proportion, they seem to be decreasing over time. But what we actually saw is that those inflammatory DCs that we see really go up during inflammation in the lung, they're not really getting to the lymph node. And what we are seeing much more of is sort of, you can see if you just look at by eye, hopefully you agree with me, you see an increase sort of red emerging and sort of an orange. And this sort of shows that actually it appears then that maybe this MGR2 CDC2s, um, which is a, a marker of those CDC2s that we've used called MGR2, or the CCR7 DCs are the major subsets in lymph node. So they're most likely to be the ones that are driving this response. And, and it does, as I said, so I've, I've already just talked about that. So, so taking this MGL2 step, one step further then is, can we go even further than that and actually sort of try and do some kind of experiment where we actually more have more proof that these are actually genuinely involved in these responses? Oh, as I've just put here. So, um, and what we did then is um, we had a, a diphtheria toxin mouse, which is the same like the dog, but this time the receptors linked to expression of MGL2. So that marker of those clusters, MGL2 is actually a lectin that's been involved in, um, it's been shown to be important in other DCs and other tissues in driving immune responses. And what we did is gave diphtheria toxin um, in the sort of second week again. And what we found when we look at the lavage of the lungs, looking at cells coming in, we saw a real nice decrease in the levels of uh, xenophils, nothing really going on with the level of neutrophilia, which is perhaps suggesting that maybe the only one response has been affected. So to compare, to sort of confirm this, we looked at the T cell response again, and it was really quite striking. We saw a much greater impact upon depletion of these MTO2 cells in reducing the type two response. But when we looked at the R17 response, that stayed fairly intact. So this, this so, so this is effectively showing, therefore, that of those subsets that are getting to the lymph node from the lungs that are increasing in both sites, it seems that the MGR2 DCs are particularly crucial in driving this type 2 response. So, so that was kind of the first, um, yeah, so, so that's kind of where we are with this story at the moment that we're sort of, you know, hopefully you'll be able to read soon. So we've now been able to take, you know, understand to a high degree of resolution now, we've got the tools to pinpoint which precise innate immune cell subsets, and we have similar panels with the, with the macrophages, and actually understand which ones are driving the allergic inflammation. But you might rightly be thinking, but you still don't know which ones are driving it, and that's absolutely true. And so that's what we're trying to do now, is, is can we go beyond of just identifying the subsets and actually start drilling down into the mechanism? And that's what we've been you know, trying to do uh, since we've been moved, you know, at the moment um but there's i before i sort of finish this talk and i realize that you know sort of time is marching on um but i realized at this point i've been very immune cell centric you know my background is, is in immunology as you've probably been able to guess i'm fascinated by how the immune response is reacting to the you know things that are foreign and coming in but at the same time what role is the sport if any is playing in this drive you know is there any role at all of the fungus in activating these responses. And that's kind of what we wanted to look at next. And the kind of the second paper we've been working on that I wanted to share. And so I don't think for this audience, I need to introduce what Aspergillus life cycle is, but there's just one thing I wanted to, to reflect upon, which is that the Aspergillus, which rapidly germinates 
um, a you know, within 24 hours, it's hyphae formation, but the zero hour spores are these, you know, conidia surrounded by this rod A menlin layer, masking a lot of the motifs which are activating immune cells. But what's going on in between that? And obviously, you know, lots of studies have looked at the sort of zero hour, the hyphae, but we're really intrigued about that middle stage, given the fact we know most spores are clearing within four hours. So, are they even doing do are they doing anything? Are the spores an active component? Are they germinating? Are they masking? Or are they just balls of antigen which are just activating the cells? And it doesn't really matter what this aspergillus is doing. And so to look at this further, and this is in collaboration with Mike Bromley and, and Sarah Gago in, in Manchester, who have been instrumental with this project. And what we looked at is um using the PYG spores, which might be something everyone's familiar with. Um, so effectively, though, if you're not, these are spores which do not have the last enzyme in UMP biosynthesis. So effectively, they're autotrophic for Udin and Uacil. So if you add in Udin and Uacil, they'll grow quite happily. And so we've done this and we confirmed this. And you can see here, these are spores after about six hours, I think. And the knockouts were, didn't grow. <laughs> and, and But if you add in Uacil and Uacil, they grow quite happily. And we did an obvious experiment where we, okay, let's take these spores that cannot germinate and put them into mice. And this is that allergic model. We, we went to day 12 at this point. And what we looked at is pretty convincingly at every stage we got, so it, the responses of the knockout spores was dramatically reduced in every readout compared to that of the wild type spores in terms of inflammation going into the airways. So this is showing then that germination and exposure of things by the spores is a critical step in driving allergic inflammatory responses. So how do we look at this further? And so effectively then, so we know, um, as I said, that the majority of spores are, are cleared from the mouse lungs within four hours. So how can we come up with a really robust way to actually tease this apart? And so we, what we utilize is with this PYG system, we realized that if we used um, addition and then taking away of you, this uridine uracil, we could actually generate time arrested stages. And this is what we did, and it's it worked really well. So I shouldn't sound so surprised when I say that, but effectively you can see, um, yeah, we did hourly stages one, two, three, four, six, and this is just running the spores on the flow, and you can actually then just measure the forward scatter and, and you know see their swelling, and you can see that after three hours we get a hint of increased swelling, but it's actually really only four hours that we got you know significant increases by four hours, and by six hours obviously you got really nice swelling. So, and this is all after we've washed off excess uridine uracil. So the system worked very nicely. We've left the spores for a couple of days to see if they generally stay arrested, and they really do. We've added back in uridine uracil a few days later to check they can still grow and they still can. So they're, they're generally just in stasis. They're not dead. They're just not able to grow at that point when we've arrested them. And so then what we did is we took these arrested stages and we added them to um, dendritic cells in vitro and we just assessed DC activation. And so we looked at many different readouts of DC activation. We looked at marks of co-stimulation, which is involved in priming of T cells. And we saw the same pictures, features that I'm going to show you now. I just didn't want to overload you with grass. And so what you can see, I haven't, we haven't done the one hour here, but in fact, if you look at zero hour spores, you know, and then two hours, whether they've seen uridine uracil or not, so the ones in gray are without uridine uracil, they really are not able to induce any kind of DC activation in terms of secretion of R12P40. And we've seen the same thing with TNF. But when we look at uh, three hours and then beyond, we start seeing that switch. So actually, we think that it's around three hours post-germination when the spores are actually starting to drive activation of, innate, of dendritic cells. I was, we were very skeptical at first. We have done this experiment many times, different hands, and now in two sites, in, up in, you know, independently. And, and we have confirmed that this is very robust. This timing is, is really quite, you know, it's amazingly robust, actually. You know, it's really this precise. Um, and so this shows then that, you know, these swollen spores then, it's that three hours potentially that is, act, you know, is when the spores are doing something. And the other cool thing about that is that that's within the time frame of what we're talking about. We've looked and we still see spores in the airways at three hours. So this would actually all fit with that, um, the earlier story that I was talking before with the allergic model. And so uh, the last data slide I'm about to show you is that this is all lovely looking at DC activation, but it actually, as I, if you go, if you think back to the start, I said that there is no sort of marker that we know of that implies of how we, how can we measure DC ability to drive an allergic response? Okay, we don't have that. We don't know what that factor is. So what we have to do is go further to prove that this is generally reflective that at three hours the DCs have seen 
three hour stage spores are more able to drive an allergic response. And so by doing that, we utilize a model that I've used earlier in my career in other um, uh, allergy settings. Uh, and so whereby we actually transfer them into naive mice. So what we did is we took the zero hour dendritic cell, sorry, zero hour spores, added them to dendritic cells or to two hours or the three hours, and we transferred these dendritic cells that have seen these spores into mice, and then we challenged mice two weeks later and then just measured the inflammatory response that we've got. And what we looked at and what we saw, so again, there's a lot going on. I'll try and go through this as slowly as time allows, but the three hours are in green, and you can see the, the, the yellow and the sort of pink are the sort of, you know, earlier stages, and the black is where it's sort of the control. There's no... Uh, you know, it was just DCs that hadn't seen any spores. And what you can notice if you look at, pre again, all the readouts, we saw the increases of neutrophils, eosinophils, and lymphocytes beyond that of the control only in the three hour spore DC pulse group. And then we looked at what lymphocytes were coming in, and they're all pretty much CD4 T cells, which again fits with what we talked about in the previous. Um, paper and I showed you today. And then when we looked at the cytokine response of these cells, it was all pretty much CD type two cytokine being produced by the CD4 T cells. And so we're only seeing three hour spores are generally therefore driving the dendritic cell to mediate an allergic inflammatory response. So this is incredibly, incredibly exciting we found because you know now that we know this time point, it really opens the door for us to pinpoint what the spore might express that's driving this response. So. I, I, I'm running rapidly out of time. So um, I, I've already talked about the first part about how the subsets we've identified and we've got these tools now, which I think are great to actually pinpoint what's going on. If people be really keen to collaborate people with other infection models, other settings to see how robust our panels are. Um, now we're looking about what the spore factor is in terms of the other things. Um, and so we're looking at, um, yeah, so yeah, what is it on that three hour stage? What is that factor? Very few people have ever been able to define the motif that drives allergic inflammatory responses. It's been one motif has been discovered in house dust mite, one in parasites. You know, it's very, 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 very fertile ground, I think, for real, some exciting stuff. And then the final thing um, that I haven't talked about at all today is we published a paper a couple of years ago now, as time flies. Is, is that we found that the lung environment itself regulates immune cell function by modifying the metabolism of immune cells that are present in the lung. So cells in other tissue sites have a dramatically different activation and capabilities. And so what we're really intrigued now is that how is, how is everything that I've talked to you today, how is that working in the context of the lung and how is you know, in, in that environment and how is that environment potentially regulating all these processes that I've been talking to you today? So, so lots to do um, and hopefully it'll keep us busy and uh, you know, be fantastic to when we can meet people again in person very soon and discuss this work further. Um, so huge thank you to everybody um, for listening and, and, and particularly for my team. So you know, it's, it's, been, it's been fantastic. Uh, team worked really hard in very trying circumstances. So hats off to them. They've been a pleasure to work with. Huge thanks to um, the centre here in Exeter. As, as, as was alluded to at the start, I moved in, in pandemic, which was not expected <laughs> as like for everyone, it's, it's been interesting, but I think, you know, been, been really made to feel welcome. And it's been it's fantastic to be part of a really amazing center. And so thank you to them. And also thank you to people in Manchester really helping me support me over the years. They're the ones who bought me the Aspergillus ties and leaving presents. So thank you to them, and uh, particularly to Andrew and, and Mike and Sarah. So I've tried to acknowledge people as, as I've gone along, but but apology, yes, yeah, so I hope that's, that's covered everyone. So, and thank you for listening. Thank you. And I shall stop sharing. <laughs> and hopefully people are still there. <laughs> thank you, Peter. They're definitely still there. We oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> it's very right. weird online. I, I'll stop talking, that's thank you. Great, go ahead and um, hide your screen too. All right, thank you. So uh, for those who are tuning in or maybe new to Mycotox, we take all the questions at the end. So keep submitting questions for Peter in the chat. I uh, do, however, highlight that they're for him. Um, and it is my great pleasure to introduce our second speaker, my colleague uh, and friend, Kirsten Nielsen, Nielsen from the University of Minnesota. Um, she received her bachelor's degree from Purdue University and her PhD from North Carolina State. And then uh, her postdoctoral work was with Joe Heitman at Duke. Uh, and that of course began to bring her into prominence in the fungal field. She uh, moved to the University of Minnesota, I think in 2007 and has risen through the ranks doing just spectacular work. She's now a full professor. 
And her CV is so impressive that I could use up our entire time telling you all the amazing things she's done. Uh, but I'll just give you a couple of highlights. She is a fellow of the American Academy of Microbiology. She was a Fulbright scholar. Um, and she has, uh, as you might imagine, a lot of amazing publications that are uh, not only incredible in their own right, but also highly, highly cited, uh, in some cases far more than, than uh, uh, comparable papers and similar in the same journal. Um, she is the PI of two R01 grants, uh, which is a big deal in the US and a lot of other funding as well. And she has just done incredible work. And she's, I think, best known as a, a pioneer of studies of cryptococcus and especially the Titan cell. And I know we'll be hearing a lot more about that. Um, I think what, to me, what really characterizes Dr. Nielsen's work is her very fearless approach to science. Um, she goes where the science leads, and she's really uh, seamlessly integrates both the uh, in-depth microbiology, immunology, world health, um, and really anything else. Uh, and it's going to be a great pleasure to hear her talk. So buckle up uh, and start your engines and get ready for an exciting ride. All right, Kirsten, take it away. Hi, thank you, Sarah, for that uh, wonderful introduction. Um, uh, yeah, I, I might go a little bit fast because uh, I tend to get a little bit excited about what I'm talking about. Um, so uh, today I'm going to tell you about um, Cryptococcus's interaction with the um, host and um, how this, uh, the morpho morphological changes in Cryptococcus uh, and in particular the Titan cell uh, impact that host immune response. Um, and, uh, and in particular, the CD4 T cell response. Uh, and so I'd like to uh, start today uh, by acknowledging the true heroes of this story, um, which are the members of my lab uh, and our collaborators who uh, really have uh, done just an incredible amount of work under an incredibly difficult situation uh, in the last couple of years. Uh, and so the immunology work I'm gonna be talking about today, um, and in particular, uh, comparison of lethal infections compared to latent infections uh, has been done by uh, Mina Ding. And then uh, the work looking at Titan cell production was spearheaded um, by a postdoc who just left, left the lab, uh, Sophie uh, Altamirano, and a previous postdoc in the lab, uh, Zhang Mingling. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, we have some absolutely fantastic uh, collaborators and also some uh, both uh, on the research side and also some cl clinical collaborators uh, who um, really help us with the translational aspects of the work that we do, uh, as well as our funding sources. So uh, when you think about cryptococcus, you probably think about the five to seven micron uh, budding yeast uh, that is well known for its production of the capsule. Um, and it's also well known for um, its ability to uh, enter the central nervous system and cause uh, meningitis. Uh, however, uh, it doesn't originally start out in the central nervous system. It starts out uh, by inhalation uh, into the lungs. And so if we look at cryptococcus in the lungs, we find that it actually has many different morphologies um, from the uh, same five to seven micron size cells that you uh, see uh, in other parts of the body and indicated here in the black arrowhead, um, as well as uh, really, really large cells uh, that you can see indicated here uh, in these histopathology sections, both in humans and in mice, uh, by the yellow arrowhead. Uh, and so uh, just to make it a little bit easier to see, I'm going to uh, show you instead some uh, lung homogenate sections or lung homogenates where we've actually lysed all of the mammalian cells. Um, and again, stain these with India ink um, so that we can more easily visualize uh, the cryptococcal cells. Um, and here you can um, pretty easily see the typical size cryptococcal cells. Um, and uh, these again in the lungs are five to seven microns in diameter. And you can see that they're surrounded by um, polysaccharide capsules um, that are pretty different in size. Um, and so uh, these can uh, make it uh, quite challenging to figure out what the cell size is. Um, and this is why we tend to use cell body diameters instead of uh, the total cell 
uh, including the capsule, um, just to make it a little bit easier um, to uh, compare uh, the differences in the cell sizes. Um, you can then also really clearly see um, the really large cells, which we refer to as Titan cells. And these can be anywhere from 10 microns in diameter up to 100 microns in diameter. Uh, and this is cell body diameter, not including that capsule. Um, and so these are really enormous cells. Now, in addition, we also see really, really tiny cells. Um, and so these are referred to as microcells, and they can be as small as one micron in cell body diameter. Um, so Alexander Alanio's lab has um, been looking at uh, these cells, and, uh, and he thinks that they're um, optimized for survival in uh, phagocytes. Uh, and so all of these uh, morphologies, as well as um, some titanite cells, which um, Liz Ballou's lab has uh, identified being produced uh, in vitro, all have been shown to have not only differences in their size, but also differences in their uh, surface structures. Um, so both the capsule structure um, and the composition of those polysaccharides, um, but also in their cell walls. Um, and so uh, they have different compositions of uh, chitin, uh, their melanin, um, their beta glucans, and also in the case of the titan cells, they have a mannan layer that's not present in the other cell types. And so what this really is doing is, is showing to the host immune system a different surface of that cell um, and, and really signaling to that host immune system that these cells uh, are a different um, form. So whether they're masking or whether they're um, really uh, showing the immune system um, something different um, to, uh, uh, from, or a different aspect of the cryptococcal cells. Um, in addition, we know that the titan cells are also undergoing alterations in their coiti. Uh, so cryptococcus is- Kristen, sorry, this is Sarah. I apologize for interrupting. Yeah. A, a couple of people have noted that your sound is going in and out a little bit. Um, so I don't know if you can just stay a little bit closer to the microphone. Thanks. Okay. All right. Is that any better? Yeah, that's good. I think it's just sometimes you lean back a little. All right. I will okay. work on. Sorry. Right. I hope closer. I didn't not put you off stride. Nope. No problem. All right. So, um, all right. Is that? Let me know if it actually backs out. It could actually be because I'm talking too loud and the microphone is backing off. So, just okay. let me know. Um. All right, so, uh, so cryptococcus is typically haploid, but the titan cells can be tetraploid, octoploid, 16C, 32C, 64C, 128C. We've actually identified some 312C titan cells um, isolated from the lungs of mice. Yeah, as you can see in these pictures um, highlighted by the yellow arrows, um, when the titan cells divide, they actually produce typical size daughter cells. And these daughter cells um, from titan cells uh, produced in vivo are actually haploid. Um, uh, in instances where we've cultured them in the presence of fluconazole, we do see aneuploid daughter cells being generated. But in the vast majority of instances, um, they are haploid. Um, however, these daughter cells do exhibit new traits. Um, so when we uh, culture uh, titan cells in the presence of uh, stresses such as high temperature, oxidative stress, nitrosative stress, um, and uh, antifungal drugs such as fluconazole, um, we see that the daughter cells that are generated um, have increased resistance to these stresses compared to typical size cells that are also cultured uh, in vivo. Um, and those daughter cells uh, do not exhibit uh, as high resistance to these stresses. And so this has led us to hypothesize um, that perhaps one of the uh, reasons for these uh, ploidy changes in the titan cells um, is to allow for rad rapid adaptation to this host environment. Um, so cryptococcus is haploid and it doesn't really have uh, extra copies of its genome uh, that would allow it to rapidly adapt. Um, however, by producing polyploids, it does allow it um, to uh, produce that uh, diversity within the daughter cells 
um, and perhaps by uh, its allowing uh, selection of the most fit daughter cells in that environment. Um, and so this, uh, if we think about this sort of Star Wars analogy um, that I'm going to use throughout the talk today, um, if we think about the, the cell surface changes, the large size of the Titan cells, um, we tend to think of it in my lab as uh, the Titan cell being analogous to the Death Star. Um, and what does that Death Star do? It sends out TIE fighters or the daughter cells um, that can then go out and wreak havoc um, throughout the rest of the body. Um, and it's perhaps these daughter cells that are, um, are able to move throughout the body um, and really uh, cause um, disease. And so this has led us to ask the question of how do these morphological changes and response to that lung environment, um, how does this occur? And in particular, how are these Titan cells formed? Um, and so uh, the fact that we're seeing these cell size changes, uh, the increase in size in, uh, in cryptococcus uh, in the Titan cells, the increase in ploidy of those cells. And then the other thing that we noticed um, was that the typical size cells oftentimes were not budding. Um, and so you can see that uh, in a lot of these images. And that suggested to us that perhaps we were seeing a change in the cell cycle of cryptococcus in vivo and that this may be a precursor to the development of Titan cells. And so we wanted to look at the in vivo cell cycle uh, in a little bit more detail and see if this would give us clues to the formation of these Titan cells. And so if we look at uh, the in vivo cells by isolating, uh, by cell sorting the 1C population and the 2C population, and then look at the morphology of these cells, what we find is that as expected, the 1C cells are unbudded, um, but we were surprised to see that these 2C cells are also unbudded. Um, and this is surprising because if you look at log phase cells, uh, so cryptococcus that's growing happily in the laboratory, um, like uh, very similar to the model budding yeast Saccharomyces, these 2C cells are undergoing budding. So they're go undergoing cell division um, at the same time that they're go undergoing DNA replication. And this is what you would expect from a budding yeast. Um, however, if we look at cryptococcus uh, in the laboratory that's in stationary phase, so a cell that is undergoing nutrient starvation, um, now we see uh, something very different. Um, so we see that uh, these, this 2C population is very similar to what we see in vivo, um, where the cells have undergone that DNA replication, but now they're paused in an unbudded state. And we weren't the first ones to see this. So actually the Japanese group um, had uh, recognized uh, this in Cryptococcus deniaformans. Um, previously and had shown that it, uh, it also occurred in response to um, nutrient starvation uh, in a few Cryptococcus neoformin strains, um, and had also shown that it occurred in vitro in response to high temperature. Um, and so uh, they saw it in response to a few different stresses in vitro. We tested a few more, um, and it also uh, was occurring there as well as in vivo. And so this really suggested to us that Cryptococcus probably is using um, at least two different types of cycling through the cell cycle. Um, so like Saccharomyces, when it's growing happily um, and has uh, all of the nutrients it needs, um, it is going to use what we're classifying as a growth cell cycle. And in this case, it's going to initiate cell division um, at the same time that it's initiating DNA replication, right? And so in this case, you're gonna see morphological changes associated with cell division at the same time that it's initiating that DNA replication. However, in instances such as in the in vivo environment or uh, in cases where it's uh, seeing stress in, uh, in the laboratory, it's going to initiate DNA synthesis, but it's not going to initiate any of the morphological changes associated with uh, cell division. And so it's uncoupling DNA synthesis from cell division. And in this case, we are seeing uh, a 2C cell 
that has no evidence of the morphological changes associated with cell division. And so this results in an unbudded G2 cell. Um, and uh, in the laboratory, this is uh, a cell that appears to arrest at that state. Um, in, uh, in a really good example of this is uh, cells that are in stationary phase. Um, and so uh, we, uh, we could also detect these cells pretty easily in vivo uh, in this population. And so um, we hypothesized that this would make sense to be a precursor cell for the type cell, as we could, uh, we could envision that re-replication of DNA in this cell would produce a 4C cell, an 8C cell, a 16C cell, et cetera, and that, might, uh, that would generate the type cell. And so uh, if this was a bona fide cell cycle, then we uh, hypothesized that perhaps there were some cyclins or cyclin-dependent kinases that we could identify that would be associated with the Titan cell cycle. And so we screened all of the uh, non-essential cyclins, cyclin-dependent kinase mutants uh, in cryptococcus uh, in the mouse model to see if we could identify some that had alterations in Titan cell formation. And we did identify one cyclin, CLIN1, uh, that had a dramatic effect on Titan cell formation. And so this mutant overproduces Titan cells. And so instead of uh, seeing our typical uh, around 30% Titan cell formation, we now see almost all of the cells in the mouse lungs converting to Titan cells. Now, if we overexpress CLIN1 instead, either under a constitutive promoter or under a copper repressible promoter. And in the mouse, copper is um, uh, limiting. And so this uh, means that that uh, repressible promoter is actually turned completely on. Um, what we find is uh, that overexpression of CLIN1 actually inhi uh, inhibits the amount of titan cell production we see, and we see less titan cell pr production. So when we have low levels of CLIN1, we see increased titan cell production. And when we have high levels of CLIN1, we see less titan cell production. And so here we're just uh, look, determining the percent of titan cells uh, with a threshold of 10 microns. And here I'm just showing you the size of the cells that are actually being generated. Um, but the data are, are basically the same. And so what this uh, suggested to us is that uh, CLIN1 was associated um, with the ability to produce uh, Titan cells and that we uh, were suspecting that uh, in our CLIN1 mutants, that loss of CLIN1 was uh, somehow associated with this uh, stress cell cycle and was shifting all of the cells down into uh, this uh, Titan cell uh, cycle and that because they were then unable to um, re-enter the cell cycle because uh, CLIN1 was uh, completely absent, then we were getting uh, all of the cells converting to the Titan cell uh, phenotype. And so uh, because we knew that uh, the stress cell cycle was also uh, involved in uh, in vitro stresses such as stationary phase, uh, we thought we might be able to use these in vitro stresses um, to be able to look at whether CLIN1, where in the stress cell cycle CLIN1 may be acting um, to try to pinpoint a little bit more uh, where and how CLIN1 was uh, interacting both in the stress cell cycle, but also um, how it may be uh, converting cells into Titan cells. Um, so to do this, the first question we asked um, was whether the clin mutants had uh, a problem entering stationary phase or maintaining stationary phase. And so here you can see that the clin-1 mutant is able to enter stationary phase just fine and is also able to maintain cell concentrations during that stationary phase. Uh, when we looked at the ploidy of the cells, uh, we do see that the clin-1 cells uh, uh, become uh, diploid faster than wild type cells. So wild type cells don't become diploid until about two days uh, into the st stationary phase, whereas the CLIN1 cells actually tend to hang out as uh, 2C cells for the vast majority uh, of their time. Um, however, 
Uh, the Clin1 cells uh, showed no difference in the viability of those cells over time compared to wild type. Um, so they had no defect in viability uh, or maintaining that viability during the stationary phase. Um, so we then also looked at whether the uh, Clin1 mutant cells had any defect in their ability to release from stationary phase. So did they have any problems re-entering the cell cycle after um, being paused in that G2 arrest? Um, and this is where we could actually see a very minor or subtle defect uh, in the Clin1 mutants. Um, so they had uh, a delay in their budding. And when they did start budding, um, we saw a transient um, defect in uh, the formation of those buds. Um, so they were elongated. Um, from about three hours until about um, six hours, uh, after which uh, the, the cells appeared to recover. Um, and by 24 hours, um, we were unable, um, they were fully recovered. And um, as I noted previously, um, you could not even detect um, in, uh, in colonies uh, any effect of this phenotype. And so it was a very transient phenotype that was really uh, focused in those early time points of, of the cell cycle in exiting um, that transition. And so this really suggested to us uh, that this was an issue of uh, the cells uh, uh, exiting from that unbudded G2 arrest um, and uh, that perhaps this was more pronounced in the Titan cells uh, in, uh, in that transition from the stress cell cycle into the Titan cell cycle. And so uh, if this was the case, then we would expect to see lower levels of Clin-1 and Titan cells than in typical cells, and that is what we see, um, but that wasn't really gonna get at exactly where Clin-1 was working. Um, and so to address this, we looked at in vivo expression uh, in, and in vitro, sorry, in vitro expression and in vitro uh, titan cell formation. Um, and what we found was, um, and the reason we did this is because uh, we uh, were unable to regulate uh, Clin1 expression um, in vivo, but we could regulate it really well in the in vitro system. And in the in vitro system, when we are producing titan cells, uh, we are doing this in the context of um, a two-step process. And so in the first, pro uh, first step of this process, it turns out we're actually inducing that unbudded G2 arrest. And in the second step of the process, you're actually giving it the environmental signals that are causing that re-replication and uh, the formation of the Titan cells. Um, and so we wanted to know if we could uh, use that to differentiate between whether Clin1 was required for the unbudded G2 arrest or whether it was required after that unbudded G2 arrest um, and during that re-replication um, and isotropic growth phase of the Titan cell formation. Um, so we first needed to verify that Clin1 was behaving the same way in vitro because in vitro Titan cells are not completely identical to in vivo Titan cells. Um, and so when we look at it, we do see that in vitro Clin1, the Clin1 mutant does overproduce Titan cells. Um, when we turn on Clin1 um, by removing uh, copper from the system using the copper repressible promoter, we can see that we do inhibit Titan cell formation. Um, however, when we add copper um, to both steps of Titan cell formation, we do not completely abolish or repress um, uh, the promoter. And so we are getting some bleeds through in that promoter. Um, and we believe that this is actually why we're not completely, um, why we're only getting wild type levels of Titan cell formation. We're not getting overexpression of Titan cells. Um, but it does allow us to differentiate between the no copper environments and the copper environments. And so if we add copper and we turn off Plin 1 uh, during this first step, so during the, the G2 arrest, um, and ask what happens, we see that we get no uh, production of Titan cells. Um, and so what this tells us is that the presence or absence of, type, uh, of Clin1 um, during the 
the G2 arrests, it doesn't make a difference. It's not uh, causing any change in tight cell production. However, if we turn clin off after that G2 arrest, when the cells are uh, re-replicating um, to generate the type, uh, re-replicating the DNA and undergoing isotropic growth, that's when we're mimicking um, this increase in Titan cell formation. Um, and that's when we're seeing the activity of the thin one actually being important. And so what it tells us is that um, this is where clin one is working. It's actually working after that G2 arrest when the cells are um, uh, making that decision is to whether they're gonna stay in the unbudded G2 arrest, whether they're gonna re-enter the cell cycle um, and, uh, and undergo cell division, or whether they're gonna shift down here into the Titan cell cycle. And so low levels of CLIN1 combined with environmental signals um, that are necessary to tell us that yes, it needs to produce a Titan cell will allow it to shuttle down here into the Titan cell cycle. In the absence of these environmental signals, we believe the cell stays in this um, 2C unbudded state. Um, so I'm gonna take just the last couple of minutes to tell you uh, about one of the other stories that we've been working on uh, in the lab on um, that we're quite excited about, which is trying to tease apart um, how uh, the morphologies of Cryptococcus are involved in uh, the host immune response. And uh, this really goes to understanding how Cryptococcus is moving from the lungs uh, to the brain uh, is the major site of disease. And when we think about how Cryptococcus is causing disease, we have to remember um, that the vast majority of disease is caused from a latent infection where most people um, have been exposed to Cryptococcus early in life um, and are controlling that infection. Um, and it's only if they become immune compromised um, that that infection is able to um, uh, no longer be controlled and is able to cause disease. And, uh, most of our mouse models are not actually mimicking this control and then loss of control, um, so latency and then loss of latency, but instead are looking at a, an, a, um, a, a lethal infection that is lethal from the beginning. And so we really wanted to focus on, well, what does our immune system do naturally? What is its best, um, uh, what is the best thing that it can do um, and what can we learn uh, from understanding what that control would look like? Um, and so we wanted um, to compare, well, what's the difference between a human latent infection versus a cryptococcal meningitis infection? And unfortunately, I'm not gonna have to, the time to go into um, how we were going to go about doing this, other than to say, um, that we have, uh, we and others have spent a lot of time looking at uh, a mouse model that John Perfect and Gary Cox have uh, generated that involves uh, inhalation of cryptococcus um, and uh, really nicely mimics uh, human cryptococcal meningitis. Um, and this has been absolutely fantastic to study, but it is a lethal infection model. We don't have a really good mouse model of the latent human infection. We've got a nice rat model. It doesn't perfectly mimic um, human infections, um, but uh, we can't do a lot of the immunology in the rat that you can do in the mouse. Um, and so we really wanted a mouse model. Um, the other thing is the strain that's used for the rat um, is in Cryptococcus deneoformis. Um, and so it's not the species of cryptococcus that typically is causing human disease. And so we wanted to see if we could develop a mouse model um, in the most commonly pathogenic form of cryptococcus um, that would allow us to establish a latent model. And so we set out to do this. Um, and again, I'm not gonna have time to go into this in great and gory detail, other than to tell you we were able to find a situation under which we could get multiple um, uh, clinical isolates to establish beautiful granulomas in the lungs. Um, it does take a while for these granulomas to establish, but they look very, very different 
than the diffuse infections that you see with lethal uh, infections. Um, and the vast majority of these mice survive the infections. They establish stable uh, pulmonary um, uh, CFUs. Um, and uh, they also have uh, take a very, very long time uh, to see Craig positivity uh, in these mice. And again, unfortunately, I don't have a lot of time uh, to talk about this. So uh, the last thing we wanted to know is could we reactivate these infections if we recompromise the mice? Uh, so we've done this using CD4 DTR mice, so mimicking um, the immune compromise that we see in HIV patients. Um, uh, so establishing the infection and then immune compromising the mice. We see increases in CFUs in the lungs. We see dramatic increases in brain CFUs and all of the mice die when we immune compromise. So this is accurately mimicking what we see in immunocompromised patients. And so we think that this is a bona fide mouse model. Um, so in, uh, in lethal infections, we see a predominant Th2 immune response. What do we, um, and we know that these Th2 uh, CD4 T cells are actually detrimental during the infection. And so if we think about these, um, we, uh, we think that they're uh, actually detrimental because uh, they're producing an innate immune response uh, that is um, actually promoting the dissemination of cryptococcus. Um, and so it's actually taking these T cells and, and modifying them in such a way that's, that's uh, turning them to the, to the dark side, right? It's making them Darth Vader T cells. Um, and so what about in the latent infection? Is that the same or is it different? So it turns out in the latent infection, the vast majority of the T cells that are being generated are not Th2 cells, they're Th1 cells. Um, and so uh, we are seeing a very different um, CD4 T cell subsets that are being generated. Um, but that's not the entire story. So uh, the Th1 cells that are being generated um, are also, uh, many of them are expressing um, the Th2 transcription factor, factor GATA3. Um, so they're Th1, Th2 hybrid T cells. And these have been uh, seen in parasitic infections. Um, and it's been shown that when, uh, when you get these hybrid cells, that they're not uh, producing the same cytokines as your typical um, T cells. Uh, and so when we look for the expression of interferon gamma in these um, TBET cells, we see that yes, in fact, they do have a decrease in interferon gamma production. And we know that interferon gamma production is incredibly important in cryptococcal infections. It produces activated macrophages that we know can kill cryptococcus. Um, and so we uh, are postulating, and what we'd like to know is whether these Th cells, which we're calling Thy cells right now until we have them uh, further characterized, whether these are actually really good cells. Um, and these are actually the cells that are completely controlling that latent infection for our entire lives, or whether they are really um, bad um, or possibly not really well um, designed T cells. So maybe they're the baby Yoda that um, if we can figure out how to activate them even better, we could clear these latent infections. And this may be really important for individuals that are getting ready to be immunocompromised. Um, so with that, I'm gonna stop um, because I know I'm way over time, but thank you. Thanks, Kirsten. So now uh, the chair, all, all speakers will come back and we'll take questions, starting with Geraldine. Okay, so first thing I've noticed is all the host response people ask multi-part questions. So we'll see how many we can get through. Okay, Peter, from uh, Robbie Falcon. Did your group find any involvement from the humoral antibody mediated immunity? Um, well, the very honest answer is we haven't looked. <laughs> so, <laughs> Um, it, almost certainly it, it might have a role whether you know how important it, it could be so I guess the only thing to, to state about that is that um, we're looking quite early because we're looking at the sensitization events so the b-cell involvement might become more when we start looking later in the um, in that model but at the moment we'd be mainly trying to address sensitization mechanisms so I guess yeah it might have less of a role but I can't say either way at the moment but it'd be cool to look 
absolutely. Okay. Uh, so Kirsten, there's a question, um, some of, part of which you've already answered, but a question of whether you see Titan cells in either other substrains of crypto or even other fungi. Um, yeah, so uh, all of the species of crypto seem to be producing Titan cells. Um, different strains produce different levels of Titan cells. Um, and uh, there seems to be a Goldilocks effect. So they need to produce enough Titan cells to have a phenotype or to have uh, an impact on, uh, on the immune response. But if they produce too many Titan cells, then it will be detrimental. Um, and uh, exactly why it's detrimental is this still a bit unclear, whether it's because it's shifting that immune response too much, um, causing too much recognition, or if it's simply just blocking so many of those cells in the lungs um, that it's preventing dis uh, dissemination is um, still a bit unknown. But uh, we definitely have uh, some clinical data that suggests too much strains that produce too many Titan cells do tend to be uh, appear to be less virulent uh, as clinical isolates. Okay, okay Peter. Um, what's the contribution of TH2 versus TH17 responses to the hallmarks of asthma, like goblet cell hyperplasia and airways hyperresponsiveness? Yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> so we mechanistically, in the model that I showed you, that um, we haven't done those kind of experiments. Um, other people have shown that type 17, yeah, other, in other models, both seemed confusingly be able to seem to drive the same response, which has led to no end of speculation of what's, you know, what's underpinning this. Um, if I was to guess, I would suspect the type two response could still be the more dominant feature that's driving a lot of the remodeling, particularly in the model that we're looking at. But yeah, it's something that we'd love to tease apart more. And as we start manipulating the system in sort of more refined ways, we might actually be able to start um, measuring that. The other thing I'd just like to add um, before you cut me off is um, the uh, the model we're looking at. Um, we have to go later to see that a lot of those features. So we're, again, because we're looking at the sense we're trying to map, I guess, model the, the sensitization event. So we have done some of the sort of remodeling airway hyperresponsiveness work, um, but we haven't done as much of that. So it'd be, it'd be really cool to look at. But yeah, we haven't ventured there yet. Uh, so Kirsten, we have a question on um, whether the ClinOne one deletion mutant, um, I guess, is it a virulent, and you partially answered that, I think, uh, but does this cell stay in this Titan formation throughout infection? Or is it possible to even track that? Um, yeah, so, uh, so that mutant, um, obviously it, it is impacting um, the cell cycle. Um, and so it is a little bit challenging um, to track overall. Um, and uh, so I, I will say that, that that mutant is a little bit hard to determine um, because so many of the cells turn into Titan cells in the lungs. Um, it, uh, it, um, it does show reduced pathogenesis. Um, it also has a 37 degree um, growth defect. Um, and again, it's, uh, we think that's also because ClinOne one is playing a role in that stress cell cycle. And that stress cell cycle is initiated um, at 37 degrees as well. Um, and so ClinOne one is really uh, heavily involved in that stress cell cycle. So anything that's causing a stress to the cell is requiring ClinOne, one um, and others had also identified, you know, ClinOne wasn't, ClinOne one is involved in melanin formation, ClinOne one is involved in high temperature growth, ClinOne one is involved in all of these other things. They're all related to stress and stress is the cell cycle is completely changed in the presence of any stress. Um, and that makes the ability to study ClinOne one a little bit more challenging. Um, so we were able to pick it up because um, we could see that dramatic increase in Titan cells in the lungs. Can we determine whether or not that impacts the overall virulence of, in the mouth? I don't think we can because we've dramatically changed the cell cycle. Um, so I don't know. 
um, because I don't think that we can actually use that strain to answer that question because it has a dramatic impact. Okay. So Pete, have you any preliminary guesses as to what on the surface of the swollen canidia is trigger triggering response? Do you think <laughs> it's unique to Aspergillus? And to take a question, later question from Gordon Brown, what about different isolates of Aspergillus? <laughs> yeah, um, I'll, I'll do the last question first. <laughs> um, we haven't, yeah, so we have started to do those experiments of trying different strains. Um, Rob Kramer published a strain quite recently that was more allergenic uh, or more allergic model. And he was very kind in, you know, we've started to have a look at that and see if there's any sort of clinical differences across the strains. Um, so far, we haven't seen dramatic differences, but which is intriguing, actually. You know, and, and the timing seems to be similar across different strains, if that, that, that window of timing. Um, the other question is, what could it be? Yeah, I mean, so... We don't know is this your answer and it's almost certainly not going to be one factor it's probably going to be quite multifactorial so um that's kind of what we're actively working on but at the moment we we're, we're still sort of trying to understand exactly what it could be um etc um and also whether it's secreted or not i don't know there could be secre you know, we have kind of excluded secretions so far because of the way that we wash off um the arrested stages i don't know seems a while ago now when I was talking about it, but when we had those stages and we washed off the excess. Um, so we don't know, we haven't looked at the secreted stuff yet and whether that could have a role, most certainly it might have a huge important role. So, so yeah, so we have lots to do. So I have not very good definitive answers at the moment, but um, yeah, so hopefully we can actually make a stab at that fairly soon and actually give people some more concrete answers. We have a couple of related questions about the clinical model. A lot of people saying what a great model it is um, and whether all clinical strains do this and do you see the Titan cells in this model? Yeah, so um, not we can't get all clinical strains to establish a latent infection. Um, so we have found uh, some of the clinical strains are like um, CAN99, which is uh, well known to be just a, a very virulent strain. Um, and we have found that a subset of the clinical strains are in that hypervirulent or extra virulent um, uh, classification um, where we cannot get them to establish a latent infection. Um, however, many of the other strains, we can actually get them to establish a latent infection. Um, uh, and so, uh, so we think that, um, that it, it is actually fully possible to establish latent infections um, in the mouse model. Uh, we are looking at why is it that in some strains, we cannot actually get them to establish these latent infections. And what's happening in those particular strains? Why are those strains uh, functionally different than all of the other strains. Um, and what I can tell you right now is that it's not tracking with specific like clades within Cryptococcus. They're scattered all over the place. Um, Cause I, I could already see Geraldine going, oh, um, <laughs> is, it, is it, are they all clustered together? The answer is no, they're not all clustered together. Um, they are uh, sporadically um, scattered throughout. And so we are trying to figure out what is it about those particular strains that is making them hyper, hyper virulent. Um, we do see dramatically different immune responses. Um, and so we are trying to track down what is it um, that's happening um, and what is the underlying basis for that. Um, but yes, in the vast majority of cases, we can get uh, the strains to establish it you just have to drop that uh, inoculum level quite low. Okay. We have three questions from Julian Nagnik. So I'm going to ask them all and you can choose which you want to answer. <laughs> One, David Curry has shown that Aspergillus proteases and host TLR, TLR4s are key in driving the allergic response. So have you looked at protease knockouts or TLR? TLR4 knockout mice, especially uh, what happens to the MGL2 plus CDC2s. Two, do epithelial cells first need to get activated to release immune factors which drive the responses? And three, any role of platelets in the CDC allergic response? 
Um, yeah, so, so lots, to, lots to ponder. Um, the last question first, um, we haven't looked at platelets. Um, they'll be really keen to try and, and measure that. In fact, we're, we're sort of on a screening expedition at the moment of host factors. And I think we're, we're adding platelets to the list to see if that, you know, so I think obviously David's shown, David Corey has shown that platelets have a role. Um, it'll be really intriguing whether they have a role in kind of the DC side of things. Um, the other questions, which I'm rapidly remembering, um, the first one was about the, oh, the proteases. Yes, that's right, the proteases. Mm -hmm. um, yes, we absolutely. So I think it's, it's really interesting with the protease. So what, what we don't know yet is whether they're actually expressed that early um, and signs of that sort of um, germination period. So that's not to say that proteases aren't involved once you've got spore germination and colonization of the aspergillus in the lungs. Um, but I guess what we might be looking at is sort of the earlier stages of that and about you know, before maybe those proteases are even expressed. But we haven't we haven't checked. So I think David Corey's model, if I remember right, it's that the aspergillus cleaves for host fibrinogen and then that activates host uh, epithelial TLR. Um, so we haven't checked that system. So we are just investigating. A, yeah, it's an obvious thing. I don't think I'm giving much away when we're saying we're investigating the role of different pathogen recognition receptor pathways on these DCs we're looking at and whether they're involved. We just, we're, we're doing those experiments at the moment and don't know the answer. So it'll be, it'll be really fascinating um, to look at that. And there was a middle one, which I can try and, what was the middle, can you remember the, the middle one? Do epithelial cells first need to get activated? Yeah, so absolutely. So this is, uh, <laughs> it's the glaring omission from my talk, right? I just ignored the epithelium as just sort of holding thing for the other cells. Um, we really, yeah. So what we're doing at the moment is tracking the spores. Um, and amazingly, yeah, so we're sort of starting to look to see where the spores are actually ending up. Um, we're, we're fairly, so it'll be fascinating to see if they actually end up in the epithelium and the role of the epithelial responses. So far, we haven't seen much evidence of them doing much, but, um, but yeah, who knows? And um, we might actually un uncover something. So, but yeah, this is sort of all these things, a very long to do list, and that'll be great to try and address these questions. Hopefully I answered those questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You'll just have to do a Zoom call. Uh, so, Kirsten, there's a question about the Titan cells. Um, could, can you say that these are a, a, a mechanism of uh, resistance, I think, hetero resistance, maybe drug resistance is what's meant, uh, because the formation is induced in stress, presumably to medications like fl fluconazole? Yeah, um, you know, I think I think that is a really good question. Um, we're doing those studies right now. Um, I think a lot of people are doing those studies. Um, you know, we know we know from our in vitro studies um, that uh, we did see the Titan cell um, that Titan cells um, did. Uh, lead to daughter cells that um, had aneuploides in response to fluconazole in the laboratory, um, and that those uh, in in a higher rate than we saw in um, the uh, than in cells that were not derived uh, from Titan cells. Um, and so, in theory, that is going to hold true in the mice. Like I said, we're doing that right now to see. Um, if that's going to hold true um, in the mice, uh, and um, to see whether they're actually going to be involved in resistance, uh, drug resistance in mice. Could, um, could you repeat that? And we you cut out a little bit there. Uh, sorry. Um, yeah. So we're doing we're doing the in vivo studies now. So the in vitro studies suggest that yes, tight cells are going to be involved in in resistance. Um, we're doing the in vivos, and that was published in uh, the Gerstein et al. paper in 2019. Um, we're doing the in vivo studies now, um, and hopefully we'll be able to share that data uh, soon uh, to, to tell people yes or no, whether we can uh, show uh, definitively in vivo, um, whether uh, Titan cells are actually playing a role or not in uh, developing drug resistance. Um, yeah. So we probably have time for two short questions each. Um, uh, and so to the audience listening, if we don't get you to your question, we apologize. The questions will be given to the speakers and they can um, email you offline if, if we have your contact information. Um, 
so I'll, so Pete got three, so I'm going to throw in one more for Kirsten here. Uh, in a quick question, is there any evidence for a relationship between the Titan cells and chronification? I don't know what that oh. is. <laughs> <laughs> so you may have to describe it for us non-crypto people. I'm not sure I know what it is either. Oh, all right. Well, maybe that person can contact you directly. Yes, please contact me and let me know what you're thinking. <laughs> I was looking at that too, wondering what it was. <laughs> All right, I don't, I don't feel, so, I'm not as embarrassed. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, from Ted, uh, given the importance of CD4 and IL-17 to aspergillus, have you been able to look at patients with HIV, low CD4 or CMC defect in TH17 uh, to see if there's any difference in the immune response? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so uh, the human side, as you can probably guess from the, the talk that I gave, we've done a lot of mouse work and, not, and we're sort of venturing into the human now. And I think we're really keen to take these hypotheses forward that we've sort of generating in more into the human situation as much as we can do. So, yeah, that would be a really cool thing to look. Uh, we sadly, again, we haven't done it. Um, but yeah, I think what we're really intrigued about as well is, you know, how could chronic, like the other thing we're thinking about, I guess, to not just say we haven't done it, is thinking about how could chronic lung disease affect the things that we're sort of looking at. And obviously, you yeah, trying to look at different cohorts of patients to, to look at that as well. But yeah, that would be really neat to try and do, actually. That's a great idea. Okay. So I'm going to use chair's privilege and ask a question to Kirsten. Your hybrid TH2, TH17 type cell, sorry, TH2, uh, TH1 cells. Um, have you done any kind of fate tracking to see if those cells originated as a TH2 and became TBET positive or, or the reverse? Yeah, uh, we have not done any fate tracking on them. Uh, other, um, uh, other than us, we, uh, we just started um, being able to use uh, some TBET, um, um, TBET, um, ZS green mice uh, to be able to just confirm that yes, they are actually um, TBET positive and yes, they are expressing beta 3 um, bona fide and, uh, and to be able to isolate them and, and do downstream analyses with them. Um, so we don't know whether they're originating as TH2s and then becoming um, hybrids or originating as TH1s and then becoming hybrids. Um, yes, we don't we, uh, we don't yet know um, uh, which way they're starting um, or whether they're actually starting as T0s and expressing both of them at the same time. Um, so based on how they're coming up, we're not seeing that they're coming up as uh, a TH2 or a TH1 and then converting over. Um, we tend, uh, you know, they're, they're coming up as that big bulk population, as that main, you know, immune response. Um, and so uh, it could be that these are just, that is the cell population that's being generated. Um, we're, we're not 100% positive. Um, so we are actually um, wanting to do a little bit more, uh, not only in terms of the phase mapping, but also in terms of, so who is functional? Are these functional? Are they protective? Are they detrimental? Uh, I think those are some of the, the questions that we're really wanting to ask as well. Okay, um, so maybe I'll ask one of the shorter questions from uh, Josh Obar. Do the MGL2 plus and CCR7 plus dendritic cells respond similarly to the pure G canidia as GMCS, CSF induced to be MDC? Uh, yeah, no, that's, um, so we're just, that is literally the experiments we're doing at the moment. So we're sort of much more trying to get the DCs out of the tissues and then start pulsing them and check. Um, so far with the panel, the other cool thing with the flow panel that we've utilized, now you can do so many colors at once, is that you can actually start profiling the cells much more accurately as they're not just defining where they are. But we've now been able to look at activation status of them. And so... And it seems to, you know, as a sneak preview, it's probably not surprising, but reassuring that the, the features that we're seeing on the in vitro cells seem to be true of the in vivo DC subsets we're seeing as well. But yeah, but we do a long way to go on that work. But yeah, hopefully we can show that next. <laughs> Whenever we can meet in person again, hopefully soon. All right, final question uh, of the day. Other than, I think Pete needs to tell us about his tie. <laughs> um, but is is there is the composition of the capsules in the titan cells uh, different 
from normal? Uh, yes. So the Titan cell capsule is more highly cross-linked um, than the capsule of a typical um, cell. Um, so it's got uh, more cross-links than, uh, than a typical cell. Okay, so I think that is probably it for today, except to thank both Peter and Kirsten very much. There's a lot yes. of loud clapping, you can't hear. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. We have a very large audience for these seminars. You know, it's, it's, it's amazing, it's wonderful that they're still going. It's a great job from Exeter, from the MRC. Okay, so do we say goodbye I, to everyone? I wanna hear about Pete's tie. Okay, the time. Oh, uh, well, the, yeah, so when I left Manchester, I think it was like March 2020 now, they, this was a collection of presents that they, they sort of dared me to wear it for every talk that I gave from now on. So I'm sort of, <laughs> I didn't want to let them down. <laughs> all right. now I realized when I put it on, it doesn't really go with this shirt at all. So I have clearly terrible taste with clothes that I need to <laughs> work on. All right, well, thank all of you. Okay. This was really great. And thanks to the people behind the scenes who are uh, invisible to the audience, but are the people that make all of this run smoothly. So thanks to you yeah. guys. Yeah. And we'll see you all in October. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye. Okay.